the study or, or, the, or the legacy of Africa in one book. That what it takes is a, a combination of a lot of books, which is very true. But what it takes is directed readings. Professor William Leo Hansberry was a professor at Howard University beginning in 1922. And what Professor Hansberry saw was that there were two things that were lacking in terms of getting African information into the schools. Professor Hansberry also felt that the lack of this knowledge in schools made it so that it impacted how students felt about themselves culturally and just in general in terms of their self-esteem and self-pride. What he came to realize was that there were two things happening. Number one is that the information that was needed was scattered. Magazines, books, periodicals, and, and other ways of getting the information, museums. And what he said was that it had to be brought together so that the information could be seen outside of its being scattered. The second thing he said was lacking was trained teachers and community members who were aware of how to get to these resources. What we have attempted to do in putting this curriculum together is to go after these different books that are scattered throughout periodicals and magazines and books and to bring it together so that you can see it. Because the one thing that I always find in opposition when I do presentations from people who don't understand what the curriculum of correction is about is that they always say, where do we begin? Because for us, many of our introduction into African and African-American history and culture is the period of, of hostage, or the period when we were hostage or kidnapped from Africa. Basically, our children get a sense of who they are from the moment that they are in someone else's hands and being controlled. And we have always argued that students must see themselves when they were in control of their own destinies before they see themselves in, con in the control of someone else's uh, program. So what we've attempted to do with, these, uh, with this curriculum guide is to bring together all of the books and all of the ideas, also realizing that the African world is just not secular but also sacred. What we've attempted to do is put it together. So what you're going to see in all that we develop through this time is that you're going to begin to see that it's very difficult, if not impossible, to separate what we will come to know as natures or the sacred with the secular world. This is something that is unknown in Africa. Uh, and it is still unknown, and it really is very unknown among us even now. And the reason why we do get into the secular part of the world is in order to deal uh, with what we have around us. What I'd like to do is just to talk about what education is first. And in talking about education, then we can get a sense of where we go from here. Education comes from the word educare, which is a, a Latin word. This word educare means to bring out. Our curriculum that we have in the Western world is very teacher-centered. It's teacher-centered. The teacher stands in just like what this is. This is not going to last very long. I'm not, I'm not going to be doing here. By the end of this session, you're going to see that everything that you need to know about this material, you already know. And there's very little, if anything, I'm going to tell you that's new to you. What I am going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to bring out of you the information that I need. And that's what a good teacher does. A good teacher brings out information from the students. There is too much of silence in the classroom among students. Uh, education was meant to be very active and not passive. Yet within the, uh, with the, within the Western world, within the Western mentality, silence is golden. And I dare say silence is not golden, and sometimes silence can be deadly. And that what I've got to do is to demonstrate for you. So in many ways, when I do different types of activities with you, please know it is not that I'm talking down to you. It is that I'm talking to you as I'm hoping that we begin to talk to our students, to bring them out. Because there are some things that I'm going to talk to you about that are very common sense to you. But to a student, it is not that common sense. And that we as adults have gone through a training method that has brought us to this point of knowledge. When we go into the classroom, many times we try to bring our students across experiences that have made us understand what it is that we're talking about. One of the things that happens in the classroom is that the teacher assumes that the student knows, and that's not true. So we've got to bring them through a step-by-step -step method. What we're going to do here can be done in the classroom, it can be done at home. It can be done in a community center. It can be done anywhere where you're attempting to get self-esteem and critical thinking skills into the minds of our young people. So we're going to begin. We're going to begin by looking at the fact that one of the things that a teacher is, is an organizer of thoughts. And what I'm going to attempt to do is to tell you a story. And within this story, I'm going to demonstrate to you how Medunecha came to be. Because it's very important that we see that Medunecha came from thoughts.
and came from concepts and just did not come through abstract means. We have a story. We have a story of a family. African folk were very family oriented. In fact, their entire existence was family oriented. Much of what came out of life was family oriented. So when the Africans would tell a story, they would tell a symbolic story. It would be a myth. And a myth is a way of telling a symbolic story that really cloaks or, or hides a, a realistic story. They just didn't come out and say it. They formed it in a story. It could be equated to Jesus the Christ's parables. When he would come forward with a story that dealt with the lives of the people. When he was around people who, did, who fished, he spoke of fish and the concept of being a fisherman. If he was speaking to people who were carpenters, he spoke in terms of being a carpenter. So what the African would do is he would tell a story according to the people that he was dealing with so that they could understand. There was never one way to tell a story. It could be interpreted in many ways. Yet the story that he told to the carpenter and the story that he told to the fisher person was the same exact story. And it would lead to the same end, but the means of getting the story to the person was different because of their own background. What's happening in our educational system is that we are not teaching our children according to their background. We are trying to force a system, a European-dominated system, over them. And it is not that it is impossible for our children to master it. It is that it just doesn't work. You cannot put a square into a circle. And you can't put a circle into a square. So when we talk about learning styles, we're not talking about, if you can understand this, it's a matter of inferiority or superiority. It's a matter of learning styles. And what we're saying is that there is a particular learning style within the African diaspora that can get our children to master mathematics, science, language arts, and everything else that we have to learn as long as it follows a certain track. Many of us are construct. We need to see pictures. This is where Medu Neche comes out of, is the construct or the picture that we're going to draw. So let me tell you a story about a family. A family, a mother and a father, excuse me, uh, you don't necessarily have to write this down because we're going to move from here to another area because I want you to know what's important here because that's another thing that we do with our young people. We cloud them with things that are unimportant and the very things that are crucial to understanding, we gloss over. So I'm going to let you know what I feel is important in terms of you knowing and then what, you, what I don't feel is important for you to know now, you'll pick up either in the text that we've written or you'll pick up in the readings themselves. One of the most important things is to concentrate. And we have to get our young people to concentrate and teach them what is important to know and what is not. You have a family, a mother and a father, who meet in just any place. And these two individuals, through, through the natural contacts, have nine children. Out of these nine children, they have an oldest child. And the oldest child's name, they name Pluto. I think you know where I'm going from here, right? But how many of our children would not know where I'm going from here? Many of them would not know where I'm going with this story unless they started getting into the Disney world and equated Pluto, and that's what you're gonna get. You'll get children who are going to say, oh, isn't that Mickey Mouse? You will get this and be aware of this because to their understanding, Pluto is a dog, a brown dog, but he's a dog. What we've got to do is change these names for our children so that they can understand what's going on. The first child's name was Pluto. Why was the first child's name Pluto, though? Why would you think that it was, why do you think that looking at the solar system today, that Pluto would be the first child? Yes. That's right, and that's key. You, you've just said something that's very key. And what we're going to build from there is an understanding as to why there would be life on Earth and not on Pluto. You have the next child that's born. What's the next child's name? Say it. Neptune. What's the next child's name? Uh huh. Planetary science. You know, by the time we're finished here, you're going to understand how important it is to know planetary science, uh, because it, 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 the next child's name was uh, Uranus. Pluto, Neptune, Uranus. Now, I'm not going to ask how many people had had called out Saturn. But those of you who do, please know that I did not get a sense of planetary science until just very recently. And the reason why I got involved in planetary science was because I was introduced to essays in ancient Egyptian studies. It was from a cultural base that I got a sense of the importance of understanding. It was never my classes that I took in school about planetary science. It was totally unimportant to me because it didn't relate to me. 
What we've got to do is show how planetary science relates to our children and to us as a living uh, force. Then the next child was Saturn. The child that follow followed Saturn was Jupiter. Jupiter was followed by Mars was followed by Earth was followed by and Venus was followed by. Now, you're going to try to tell a student this story. How, how can you tell a student this story? How could you tell a student this story? Diagrams. Diagrams. Construct. How are you going to actually visualize and put these, how are you going to make Pluto concrete? Families. That's right, okay, families. But now, are you going to draw the planets to be actual human beings? When you talk about family, the first thing that would come to a child's mind is a family of human beings. What do you do? Now think in terms of the African thought pattern. What are you going to do? Bless you. Okay. Colors. Okay, you use colors. What else would you use? You'd use family. You'd use the concept of, of making the link of the human with the actual celestial body. But what I'm getting at is that this is where Meruneche came from. It came from Africans attempting to tell a story that was not of human characteristics, but it was a story that if you use concepts that the human being could understand, you could then take those concepts and teach people different things. Hence came the Ogdode of the Memphite theology. You had the Patar, you had the Nun, the Nunet, you had the Atum, you had the four pairs of essences that came out of this experience because the Africans were trying to tell a real story in terms of a phenomenon that could not be explained. So you have Meruneche. You have the concept of the Ogdode or the movement of, of celestial bodies out of a creation story. But now you also have something else happening. And what else is happening comes out of this first lesson plan. Because in telling this story, the ancients attempted to link up human phenomena, things that happened to the human being with the creation of the universe. So what did they do? They told a story of a nebula, of Ptah. If you uh, see in, well, I, well, I'll show this to you on, on my set. This was the story of Ptah. This was the story of Ptah who was molding and fashioning. This is in your text who is molding and fashioning the world. Ptah represents land. The reason why I'm spending time on this is because it's a misconception in terms of how the world, the Western world, looks at what they call gods. These were not gods, as we know them in English. These were essences or manifestations of earthly things that allowed people to be able to respect and honor a higher force. And as we get into this, uh, you'll see that they were monotheistic. They believed in one God. They always believed in one God. And as you get into the text, you will see this. You'll also see where other forms and other faith systems came out of. But let's talk about the Ogdo. Ogdo is a story that you read about in Stolen Legacy. For those of us who have read Stolen Legacy for the first time, you know that you have to read it a couple more times. For those of you who read it quite a few times, you know that there's still more information that you can get out. But what I'd like to do is to talk about the Ogdo so that you can understand it. And so that at least this part of George G.M. James' work is understood by you so that this week and next week you'll be able to understand what it is that we're talking about. What the Ogdo said was that in the beginning... Uh-oh, forgot my chart. Only thing I didn't bring. Teachers, help me out. I didn't bring it. They told me teachers never forget that chart. I'm a student today. <laughs> If I could just get one piece of chalk, I'd be all right. Uh, the primates of the essences. Again, because of what George G.M. James was exposed to, he had to use words such as gods and goddesses. Uh, you'll notice that within the text that I write, I don't refer to them as gods and goddesses because it's too confusing. 
And because of the English value that we put on words like gods and goddesses, it would be misunderstood. Because the very same concept of gods and goddesses in, in the African faith system is equivalent to the saints in the Christian church. Uh, they, they are, except the difference is that within the Christian church, they are personifications. In other words, the saints are human beings. In the African faith system, you had nature. You had different forms of nature representing different aspects of the greater God or the greater one God that in that one form was able to do a lot of different things, and we'll talk about it as we go along. I want to tell you, when I first did this program, I did it at the Institute for Youth. And, you know, you, you learn your best lessons when you make your strongest mistakes. We had put together an entire staff, and at the end, I sat down and I looked over all the work, and I came to realize that the most important thing that we had not discussed was what was going to get us through, and that was the natures. Because the natures are a part of almost everything we're going to do in the beginning. And also in part two, which is ancient civilizations. And if there's not a strong understanding of what natures are, it might be misconstrued or misunderstood when we get into the actual uh, lesson plans themselves. So what I did is I put the staff through a, a two weeks, I think, of intensive study of natures, which I don't think was proper at the time. Since then, what I've come to realize is the best way to do it is to introduce natures periodically as they come up through the lesson plans and not attempt to do an entire piece on lesson plans before you get into everything else. So the natures that we're going to deal with, I want you to understand from the beginning, are representations of one God. And that underneath this one God, this God manifested itself in nature, in the animals, in the plants, in the rocks, in whatever was existing, that is what was representations of God. You know how you hear people when they say that God is in everything? Well, this was the concept that the Africans had. And in so doing, they gave different characteristics to these different essences that they saw. In no way was it pagan. They did not worship, as I showed you, Ptah. They did not worship the human being Ptah. They worshiped the essence or the concept of creation that Ptah represented. Do we understand that? Because if we understand that, then we'll be clear down the road. If we don't understand it, I'd like to stop and at least get that clear in, in all of our minds. Because it's a misconception. And that's what leads to people accusing Africans of being pagan. Paganism came out of the Roman experience. Because the Romans didn't understand what the Greeks didn't understand. Because the Greeks didn't understand what the Africans were talking about either. So when they adapted the Greek faith system under the Ptolemies, which includes all of the Cleopatras and all of the others during the uh, Roman period, uh, the Greek period, I mean, you have the Romans coming in and learning secondhand information that the Greeks got wrong, and that's when they looked at these different essences and said, these are actually gods. But to the Africans, they were never gods. They were never to be worshipped. They were only manifestations of the greater creator, which was a one god. And wherever you go in Africa, you see Africans talking about one god. And that out of this one God, there is many representations of this God, as we do with the saints. Yes, sir. I just want to be clear. Now, that one God is Pata or? No, that one God comes under many different manifestations, but basically, Amun-Ra is a name that they gave it. Amun-Ra Amun was one name. So when we see R-A, that's who they're talking about? Ra. I'm sorry? R-A? Yes. Yes, they are. But now... As we get into this lesson plan, you're going to see what I'm talking about in terms of it. Because they never looked at it as a person. You see, we're deep, steeply deep in the Western mentality that has personified a God. And has personified it to the point where he's white, with white hair, with a white beard. We have personified it to the point where that's crystal clear. And anything that deviates from that look, we feel, not all of us, but many times we feel guilty. And think that we will not get the better life if we look upon God as anything else. This is the psyche. This is why the first thing they attacked among Africans and indigenous populations was not their body and was not their educational system. The first avenue into the destruction of black civilization was through the spirituality. And once they could break your spiritualness, once they could make your God look like them, that's when they could come into your educational system and that's when, after, the edu after they broke your spirituality down, and through education they broke your mind down, then they broke your body down. And that was a natural sequence of events to take place. So what do we have to do as a people to get back on the right track? 
I always believe go to the root of the problem. We took care of the physical problem. We're attempting to take care of the educational problem right now, which is the curriculum of correction. That's why we're here today. But the spirit is what we've got to bring back. So my purpose here, even if you ask me, people say to me, well, man, you don't sound like you're talking Christianity. You don't sound like you're talking Islam. You don't sound like you're talking Judaism. You don't sound like you're talking uh, uh, Zen or any of the other faith systems. And that's because the African faith systems created all of the other faith systems. And that you can see the African spiritual essence in every faith system that exists, whether it's in Asia, Europe, or the Americas. You can see it. The whole concept of the God, of the one God creating and going through the whole process. So it's important that we understand this and know this from the beginning to understand what natures were. And what word is nature close to? Nature. nature. The nature of something is the nature. This is an English word, but it comes out of the African diasporan language. It is the nature. And in nature, you have different essences. And just for example, you have what is known as a uh, Anubis in the Egyptian cosmogony, where you have a dog. But what is this dog? This dog is a discriminator. Dog is a discriminator because the dog, him herself, knows what is dead and what is not. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have Impu or Anubis, which was the dog. You'll see the dog as the guardian. And that's where the concept of the dog is man's best friend. You see, the European world got it all wrong. See, there's no way. See, you know something wrong with society when a man's best friend is a dog. I mean, that automatically tells you something. Uh, uh, nature put it so that the female would be man's best friend. And any society that looks upon a dog as a best friend, you know right from there, you don't want to get too close to it. Because there's a problem right in the psychology of what they're thinking about. I'm sorry? Oh, absolutely. And I can understand why people would be close. And it's important to have respect for animals. And, in, and yes, in all life. So there's nothing wrong with that. But it's in the concept of believing that an animal would be your best friend as a universal theme. See, when the European says, man is my best, uh, the, the dog is my best friend. And when he goes out hunting or doing whatever he's going to do, he says, come on, boy, come with me. I mean, you're supposed to be saying, come on, honey, come with me. You see, take your wife with you. She's your counterpart. Or take your girlfriend or your boyfriend. That's the counterpart. But in this world, they take different types of opinions. But this concept comes out of Impu or Anubis, who is basically a scavenger and who can tell and discriminate what is dead and what is not. What is putrid and what is not. What can be eaten and what cannot be eaten. So what did the African do with this concept? What the African said, well, this would be a good way to describe among humans how we can discriminate what's right and wrong what's good and bad. So they took the essence or the meaning of what this animal could do and they gave it a godly function because they believed that it was the creator that gave this animal the ability to discriminate and to know. I mean, they can get right to the point of something that's about to be dead and can't be eaten. And that fine line allows them to be able to be a judge or, or a discriminator. So basically the natures in the beginning, the primates of the gods or the essences, what you have is a story that takes Nun. And out of Nun, there arises a land that they call Ptah. Now, Ptah is land. But within the African story, when you look at your text, you will also see that they would make Ptah look like this. Fashioning the cosmic egg of the world. Fashioning the cosmic egg of the world. They took an abstract idea and they made it concrete. But they didn't worship the concrete. They worshiped the abstract. They worshiped the concept of the creation of the universe. But to fathom that and to understand it, they gave it the characteristics of something human that they could understand. But they did not worship the human or the form of Ptah. They worshiped what Ptah could do. On top of, out of Nun, which is the primeval waters of the world, came Ptah, which is land, or the concrete, the concrete coming forward. And then 
to top all that, you have Atum, who is the combination of all of the principles, who is able to become creative utterance. In other, world, in other words, what the world is doing at this time to the Africans is that it's growing, it's manifesting itself, and it's getting into the position to begin to start the creation of everything that surrounds us. This is in the Memphite text. This is written in the Memphite text. This is called the primates of the gods, which I like to call the primate of the essences. Now, from this concept, what they do is that they say Atum, after achieving this level of greatness, begins to name the things around him, her. It's very important to see him, her here and the balance, because what you're going to see is that you're going to get eight, you're going to get eight essences out of this. What happens is that they say that they begin to throw parts of itself off. Atum throws parts of itself off. And in throwing parts of itself off, that represents the naming of the things around us. So you have, these are, this is the old dough. You don't necessarily have to write this down unless you want to. But you have the Ogdo. One of the first things to come from this concept is Nun. Nun is the primeval waters. But you just can't have Nun, you have Nunet. which is to counter heavens. What do you have right there automatically? Balance. Balance. Next comes Ha. You have Ha Hent. What does Ha represent? Boundless. Boundless. So we'll call it infinity. Infinity being boundless. Her head would be finite. Finite. Can I ask a question? Sure. Would, um, then um, in terms of male superiority, couldn't you get hung up in that if um, ha is represented as infinity and female is finite? No. Yeah, I no. Mean, uh, in this, if you think in terms of the Western world, yes, you could. Okay. But if you thought in terms of the African, you cannot have boundless or infinity without the boundless. Do you see? It's a whole nother thought pattern that we're dealing with. I'm, I'm, I'm asking us, and normally what I like to do is I like to give out a piece of paper and have all of the, partic all of the participants write on this piece of paper, I am now going to forget everything I learned in the Western educational <laughs> system. And one at a time, you come up and you throw it in the waste paper basket. You come up and just throw it. And if you really want to get active on it, step on it. But what we have to do is that we have to separate. Yes, looking from the Western world, you could get a sense of male superiority. But coming out of the African perspective, you see that you cannot have primeval, see like the primeval waters and the counter heavens. You can't have one without the other. So it is never a sense of what is more important. Because without one, you don't have the other, so it doesn't make a difference what's important. This is the African mentality. It is from the beginning a balance of what is known as opposites or complements. From the very beginning, you have this duality in place, where without one, there is no other. And that there's no such thing as superiority. Because from the African perspective, a woman, you see this whole concept of, and, and Malcolm often said it, about the civil rights bill. Uh, if, if folk of African and Latino descent were looked upon as Americans, there'd be no need for a civil rights bill. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is in the very premise of the fact that we are considered second-class citizens that you need a law to make you equal to. Mm -hmm. So even in having this civil rights bill and the fact that Bush didn't sign don't mean a thing to me because it doesn't mean anything to me in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because if I am an American, there's enough laws on the books to protect me as an American. So I don't need the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, or whatever that is. A woman does not need the ERA amendment because her God-given right is to be equal. She's born equal. So what you need a law to say that you're equal for. All you have to do is be born and you're equal. From the Western perspective, that's not true. 
So you must be a second class citizen from their thought pattern in order to enact a law to give you freedom that if you were considered to be the first class citizen, you wouldn't need any amendments because you'd be free from the very beginning. You see. So amongst the Africans, it was never a, 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 a sense of the fact that one was more important than the other. You cannot have anything that's boundless unless you don't have something that's boundless. You cannot have primeval waters if you don't have counter heaven. Okay. Ka and Kaket. Kuk. Kaket. Okay, it's, you know, it's going to be in your text. Let me tell you, it'll be in your text. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to concentrate on what we're doing. Uh, even if you just want to write it phonetically for what it sounds like, go ahead, because it's in your text and you'll get a clear picture of it. Okay, what I'm going to attempt to do when we meet like this is to just put things into their proper perspective. Ka and Kaket, Ka represents darkness. And Kaket, light. Now, to speak to my sister's point, dark as opposed to light within this civilization, light is better than dark, right? Yet light is female. But light comes from darkness. You can only get light when you have darkness. So one is bound with the other. So it's not a matter of which is more important. It's that without darkness you can't have light, and without light you can't have darkness, and it's the balance of the two that bring the balance of the harmony in place. Say it again. Law of the law of opposites are complements. But again, I, I ask us to be careful of the concept in the English language of opposites. Because when you look at the word opposite, you get the sense that they are different, different. and they're not. They're mere extensions of each other. Like good duality. Uh, yes, you could, but it wouldn't express the concept of them being on two sides of the pole. You have something that's good and you have something that's bad. When does something that's bad become good? And when does something that's good become bad? It's only by a matter of degree. When you have something that's cold and you have something that's hot. When does what's cold become hot? And when does what... It's very difficult to tell. So what you're looking at is two sides of the same thing. And this is what they're saying. On one side, you have that which cannot be bounded. It's boundless. On the other side, you have the bounded. But what, where is the point where what's bounded becomes boundless? And the other way around. To the African, it didn't exist. So you were dealing with a continuum that was the same, but mere extensions or degrees of difference. The final pair was Amun Amunet. According to Dr. Asa Hilliard, it has been agreed amongst people of African descent that in Meru Neture we will include the letter E. So these would say Nen, Nenet, He, Hehet, Kek, Keket, Amen, Amenet. But because of your reading, see, I'm well aware of what the brother's doing, and I support him wholeheartedly along with Raketi Wimby and Roosevelt Robinson, who, who, are, who are very good in Meru Neture. But I also know that if I were to rewrite these words, and then you read in George G.M. James, them referring to it as Nun and Nunet, you might not put the two and two together. So what I give you is what you're going to read. What, but I'm going to tell you here that it will change as we go along. Because what you're noticing in your reading is that there are no vowels. And the reason why there are no vowels is because of the way the Africans spoke, and we've not yet been able to really decipher how Africans actually spoke Medu Neture. We don't even know if Medu Neture was a spoken language. It was a symbolic language. And we're returning back to the symbolic language, aren't we? Right? Aren't we, when we go to men's room, we see a circle with something look like a man in there? In that Medu Neture? Anybody from any language could understand what's going on there. That was the purpose of Medu Neture. You have a circle where it has something that's crossed out and there's a radio in the middle. What does that mean? That's Meru Neture. The concept of Meru Neture was to take a visual and to let you know what the visual stood for. In other words, when you come upon that circle with a man in it, he's in this room, no, you do not go in that room. The men know that you do. With the radio, with the, the slash through it, you know if you have a radio, you turn it off. You know you don't play it. This is telling you something that Meru Neture was about. And what we've got to do is get back on that, that understanding of what Meru Neture is. 
from a conceptual perspective. Okay, so Amun. Amun is hidden. hidden. And Amunet is exposed. Okay, exposed. And the word that I use is revealed. Okay, but again, exposed means the same thing, that which you can see. But you see, there's something else about this that we have to talk about. Because these represent something. What do you think Nun meant to the ancient average? Now, we're talking about the creation of a universe. We're talking about this cosmic egg being impacted by something to create a, a series of events that would lead to the planets coming into existence. Please know this universe is just not our solar system. The universe that they're talking about is the entire universe that goes for billions and billions and for whatever we experience and what we don't know is involved in the universe. Not just our Milky Way, not just our nine planets with the parent sun. We're talking about the entire universe. What is it that primeval waters represent? Nun. Just as an example. Let me give you a hint. And the importance of hydrogen in birth. The importance of hydrogen in the creation of the world. How about the counter heavens? Oxygen. How about the boundless? It's a concept. It's a big concept. Limitless. See, you don't have to follow what, what's going on here. We're going to change. The African thought pattern was very complex. And many times they went along a certain route and then they changed on you because the situation demanded that the situation change. Boundless gives you the concept of things that are limitless. The universe is limitless. There are things that you just can't get to and that's limitless. How about the bounded? What would the bounded represent? Limited, or that which can be counted. Like in this room right now, there is a limited amount of people in this room. That concept can be, uh, can be uh, understood. You can go outside and you can count every piece of grass that's there, or every sand. It may be a lot, but it can be done. That's bounded. You can count the amount of books that we have. Anything that cannot be counted, and anything that can be counted. Ha and ha het. So you have the limited. Anything that exists in our universe that has its limit. How about darkness? What happens when somebody say, you in the dark, man? What's what? Ignorance. Thing, and ignorance in the sense that which you don't know. It's not the negative concept of ignorance. You know, people say, you ignorant. It's not like that. It means that things that you do not know. How about light? Knowledge. How about hidden? How about amun? Unseen. Things that you can't see. The intangible. We call it the intangible spirit. And finally, Amunet. Yes. Let's, let's follow along with the word tangible. The opposite would be the tangible. It would be tangible. The word that I use is material. The tangible material. You have the intangible spirit and the tangible material. Okay. When you add up all of this, what number do you come up with? Eight plus plus all, all of these things. Nun comes twice. So if you took nun here and counted it here, you have eight plus plus no, because nun is with here. 
So you don't want to repeat none. And what is our numerical system based on? This is where the ancients began to develop their mathematical system of base 10. So don't believe the Western world when they tell you that they invented the base 10. It was, it was in its fundamental terms thousands of years ago just by the manifestation of what they saw in the old dove. Now, let me tell you what comes out of the oak dough, and then we'll do our first, and, and then I'm going to tell you something else, and then we'll be able to take a break, and then we'll come back and do our next lesson. What's important to understand about the oak dough is, number one, water is the source of all things. Remember, Ata and Atum both come up out of Nun. All things come out of water. Number two, create, you, you don't have to write this down because this is in your text, okay? What I really would like us to do is to concentrate. I'd really like you to concentrate and to look between the, uh, the, the, side, uh, the, the diagrams and myself, and the text will cover everything else. Anything that I think that is not in the text, I'll tell you, please copy. Creation was accomplished by the unity of two creative principles, Pata and Atum. Look at Pata and Atum as creative principles. Not as people, look at them as, as, as a creative principle, patanatum, the unity of mind with creative utterance. All, defined, all divine decrees came into being in the thinking of the mind and the commanding of the tongue. Number three, Atum was the intermediate essence in creation. She, he was the sun or the fire essence, the concept of heat. The concept of heat and light is the creation of life. When we look around us, any place where there is light and heat in abundance, you have life. You have it in Fort Lauderdale. In this country, you have it. In California, you have it. Yet, when you get up in the northern climes, the Norman climate, the northern climate, it gets cold. We are experiencing cold. And when it's cold, what happens? Nothing grows, and that which did grow to be resurrected again, by the way, but still, it cannot function in cold climate. Life comes out of heat and light. Okay. Number four, opposite complements control the life of the universe. The reason why our world is in trouble today is because there is not a balance of the male and female in the human family. That's the problem. When you get down to the center of the problem, it is that we are not balanced. We in this world see anything male as being the power, as being the best. And we don't see that without the female, the male would not exist. We don't see that. And one of the problems that we are going to have is to be able to look at the world a different way. From the very beginning, you have male and female here. From the very beginning, you have male and female. There is nowhere here that the male brings forward the female. Nowhere. You always have the duality, the complements. And without that balance, it cannot exist. None of us would be in this room today if there was not a balance and harmony between male and female. That's one thing we know right off the bat. And not only that, but if we want to give credit to where credit really is due, the reason why we're here is more because of the female than because of the male. And all you have to do is look at our communities where our females are the, are the leading people within the household, and you'll see that. If not, we wouldn't be here now. So it's important that we look at this and understand what the ancients were telling us about the duality of society, that without one, there wouldn't exist the other. So it's very important. And finally, fifth, um, five. From the creation of the Ogdo, there came order and arrangement, or the Enid, and the elements, atoms, with their characteristics. So what we have is a universe being created here, an entire universe, and what's happening now is that you have planets coming into existence at the same time. We have taken it from the total universe, and we're now focusing on our particular solar system right now in the Milky Way, our solar system. And out of this is going to come certain characteristics, elements, and other things that are going to create our world. Uh, this can be con uh, continued in the next lesson. I want to give you three scientific principles. Now, I've just given you the, the comedic view of this. 
Now I want to give you the scientific view of this. This is also in your text. There are three theories of how the universe came into existence according to the European world or the Western world. First one is Sir James Jean. Sir James Jean believed in what is known as the passing star. Professor Jean said that a passing star passed so close to this nebula, which was the sun or the female aspect, that it created a, a tearing away or a speeding up of this nebula. And from this speeding up, this nebula began to throw off parts of itself, which eventually became the planets. Mm -hmm. Professor Raymond Littleton said that a self created explosion, which is known as the Big Bang, came into effect. And in, an explo in, in exploding, this nebula threw off parts of itself, which became the planets, the asteroids, the moons, and everything else that we have in our solar system. Finally, Professor Laplace, and the Laplace theory said that the sun began to bulge at the equator. And in bulging at the equator and then coming back in, what began to happen is that this kind of movement when it would go in and would come out, it would throw off parts of itself. And that is what Laplace said. But in studying the symbolism of ancient Kemet and keeping in mind the holisticness of African thought, this author theorizes that the Memphite theology embraced all three Western concepts of the origin of the universe. The Ogdode is what Laplace considered to be his original hypothesis. And I have original with a lot of question marks after that. You understand why I got those question marks? because they're taking credit for things that they, didn't even, that they didn't even know of prior to going into Egypt or Kemet. With this action, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I sped up. The Ogdode is what Laplace considered to be his original hypothesis, nine essences in one essence, and that the fire essence creates other essences by throwing off parts of its own body. Our present solar system was once a molten, gaseous nebula, and this uh, nebula rotated at enormous speeds, but what we have to do is figure out what made the nebula do this. And in looking at the African theory of the Memphite theology, in looking at the way the, the, the Netches were looked upon, and in looking at today's scientific thought, I have come up to the conclusion, and this is my own personal thought now, because I want to clearly let you know what I have looked at and what is actually written. What I've just told you is actually written. But to me, it would appear that just like the human is born, so is the universe. Let's look at it. What you have is a nebula. Let's take all of the theories and put them together, and we're going to come up with something. You have a nebula, which is a cloud of gas and dust and things like that. And you have a star, what I call the passing life star. But I theorize that it didn't pass, that it in fact penetrated the nebula. And when you look at books, that's what the passing star looks like. Now, may I ask you, what does that look like to you? <laughs> this is a holistic way of looking at the creation of the universe. That it, and now, I'm not off-center, because there is a theory of the passing star. But to me, big bangs are not created by things that pass. They're created by things that come in contact with each other. That's physics <clears throat> that you know, that things that pass one another do not necessarily create explosions, but things that penetrate, in fact, do. Now, this nebula is molten hot. Passing stars are very cold because they're in interstellar space. You have hot and you have cold coming together. What do you think is only natural to occur? That there would be an explosion. And that is where the Big Bang Theory What would happen to something that's hot and slow, hit by something that's cold and fast? Once these two entities came together, and this is step two, and now you have one essence. Coming out of two, there's one. When the male sperm, the human male sperm, comes in contact with the egg, that is no longer an egg by itself. It is no longer the sperm by itself. It is now one essence. Two are one. And in bringing these two together, chances are they would kind of balance each other off. 
So here you have something hot and slow, cold and fast. Again, keep in mind the opposites. The next step would be that this whole piece would speed up and warm out, right? Wouldn't speed to the, uh, to the rate of the passing star, but it wouldn't be as slow as the nebula, but it would have an impact. And immediately what happens is that it begins to throw off parts of itself. This is diagram number one, number two. What happens in number three is that you have this nebula rotating at a very enormous speed, and it begins to throw off pieces of itself. This is part of the hypothesis. Not just mine, but what actually happened in terms of this universe coming into existence. And it throws off parts of itself. What happens to the human fetus as it's growing those first couple of hours? It begins to throw things off of itself. This sperm and egg begins to multiply its cells as it looks itself. Nothing changes form. It just becomes more of itself. It begins to throw off pieces of itself. So you could say that the universe at this point is pregnant and it's having its children. Number four is actually all of the planets in place. With this parent nebula still there, male and female in essence, you have all of the nine planets. For the sake of time, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this is supposed to be nine planets here. Let's just say they're nine planets. You, you, you'll see it here. So what you have at this point is the birth and balance of our universe and what we call the family of natures. The first worksheet is going to talk about this and is going to begin to show you where it is that we are. And what I like to do is I like to present the information to you. I'd like you to look at the worksheet and I'm going to go over the worksheet with you so that it's very straightforward and that we don't have any problem understanding. Because one of the things that we do with our young people in school is that we play games with them. We teach them a little bit of knowledge and then we test them. And I think that what we've got to begin to do when we teach our children is to have a different way of doing it. And so when we, when we give out worksheets to our students, it's very non-threatening. And we'll do it together. And if you don't get it the first time, we'll try it next time. And if you don't get it then, then we'll try it again. But whatever it's going to take for you to get it, I'm here for you and I want to make sure that you get it. Yes. Where does Memphite come from? Okay. Where where did the word come from? Memphite came from the name that the that the Greeks gave to Memphis. Memphis is located in um, it's near Cairo. It's right outside of Giza. And what happened was is that the ancient Africans called it Hikuk Ptah, or the soul of Ptah, which meant. And as we get into the first dynasty, you see. The way in which this lesson plan series is set up is I'm going to introduce you to information when I think it best suits that particular frame of reference. When questions come up like yours, I, I will address them, but you'll understand this better when we get to the first dynasty of ancient Kemet. But Hikku Patel was the capital, the holy capital. When Menes first came up, he took, he re-diverted the waters of Happy, or re-diverted the, the waters of the Nile River, and he created land. And on this land, he created a sacred uh, capital for the new United Kingdom. He named it Hikup Patar because remember, Patar represents an essence of um, um, an essence of um, land. 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 land, the hill, the primeval hill. Right. So in building this land, he, he dedicated it to the essence of what land was. So he named it Hikup Patar or the soul of Patar. When the Greeks came in, they couldn't pronounce Hikupata, mm -hmm. so they renamed Hikupata Eguptos. When the other nations came in, they took Eguptos and made it Egypt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, now Memphis, Memphis is like someone coming to the United States and calling the United States Washington, D.C. Okay. They walked into the capital of the land and named the whole land after the capital because they didn't understand and they didn't know. 
And the way the Africans looked at it, they spoke of it as if it was their land. It's the soul of Qatar. It's the soul of the United uh, Kingdom. So to them, when the Greeks kept hearing this Hikupata, Hikupata, they couldn't pronounce Hikupata, so Hikupata became Egyptus. When others came in, Egyptus became Egypt. Was there another? Yes, my brother. Um, Pata, that uh, I've heard that it's supposed to be the, they created a guild from it, or craftsmen, or, or uh, guild workers, or something like that. Yeah. Um, if that's so, then what would actually be? Well, Atum is many things. Atum, in fact, in your text, you'll see that Atum is looked upon as number of quite a few things. But the present day Adam comes out of the African concept of Atum, which means self created. You see, the Western world got that wrong too. They said it that which could not be split. But what? They split it. So Atum cannot mean that which cannot be split. The African word for Atum means self created. It's creative utterance. It's, it's, the, it's the pinnacle of everything that exists. And you're going to see this as a recurring theme for the, at least the first six lessons. The concept of bringing everything that you have to its crystallization. The ancient Africans called it, within the English context, is what you would call uh, transmutation. It's the bringing of an essence to its highest form. Okay, let's look at the uh, lesson plan. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the worksheet. And, and let's go through this. Did I give you the wrong one? When you look at the top, you see this all in four stages. There was a nebula in place, and that there was a passing star or a force. It didn't even have to be a physical force, a force that created an explosion in the nebula. It's okay? Okay. Nebula is hot and slow, passing light star is cold and fast. What automatically do you have here? Automatically, you have opposite of consciousness. Right off the bat, you know that something's happening where they're opposites to each other, and that something's going to happen through that. Number two. Nebula cools down and speeds up. Passing light star warms up and slows down. What have both of them done? Upon impact with each other, what has happened? Neutralized. They've neutralized each other, and what was fast became slow. What was hot became... What was slow became... And what was cold became? You see the balance. The balance is really what's important. This is where everything that exists comes from. Opposites and complements. It's called the law of polarity. Number three, please. Nebula passing, life star craters and created. They are on their way to cosmic balance. It says that opposites upon contact with each other. Now we're talking physics and science here. This has nothing to do with the comedic origin. This right now has to do with the curriculum of correction in terms of teaching our children physics and Newton's law and all these other laws that they take credit for. The Africans had this in place from the very beginning thousands of years ago. Physics, biology, botany. And because they looked at everything holistically, I can see their story coming out of a very human experience, a very human and dynamic. And then finally, number four. Okay, the birth and balance of our universe. Okay, now the, the direction. Place the proper number next to the explanation that, uh, that the scene above depicts. What would the first one be? Number two. Please put that in. Do you see, does anybody not see why? The nebula passing life star cools down, contracts, and gains greater speed. Two. Okay, how about the next one? All nine planets evolve. These planets throw off other bodies that become moons, asteroids, meteors, etc. Number, Number four. How about the next one? A passing life star penetrates nebulous hot gaseous clouds and creates a tremendous explosion. And the final one? 
The nebula passing light star bulges at the equator and begins to throw up gaseous rings that form planets. Now, tell me something. If we were to take the, hum the female human body, around where would the equator be? The equidistance, the, the middle of the human female form, proportionately. It doesn't have to be this way all the time, but basically, where would it be? And what bulges when a woman brings forth life? Yes, but what what happens? It be, you see, when you take the African view of the world and you see how it works out, and you look at the Ogdode and the story that the Africans told, you are culturally hooking information to your culture that our children can understand. It was only a matter of 15 minutes before I knew every planet from the oldest to the youngest. This is another thing. I don't teach the planets from the Earth perspective. In other words, I don't look at the ice. I deal with the entire. I see Pluto as being the first planet to be discussed because Pluto is the oldest child. When you look at the Earth, you're earth center, And that's why the, why the European world believed that the Earth was flat for so long. That's why they believe that the universe revolves around the Earth. Because today's Western world thinks the world still revolves around them. And what the reality of it is, is that looking at this holistically, you come to realize that we are all part of a universe, all part of a cosmos. And that in order to understand planetary science, you don't begin with the Earth. First, you begin with the Sun. But after you deal with the parent, you then go to the oldest child, who is Pluto. Who's the next child? Okay, well, let's... Let's do our next uh, worksheet. Now, what I've done right now is set up for you. The first thing that I'd like you to do is look at the theory. This is a theory. Please note this is a theory. This is not written in stone. This is a theory. This is a way of looking at information that you can create a myth out of realistic information and come to see. When I look at this type of a symbol, where you see a star penetrating a nebula and creating life, that is so natural to me in terms of the way I came into this world that I could never forget how the world came into existence just by the naturalness of it. To think that it could happen any other way uh, is, of course, you know, people's opinion. But I try to look at natural sources of information. And to me, it is so natural to see how something like this could occur when I see it happening millions upon millions of times, not only among humans, but among the animal world the same way. It happens constantly. So why couldn't the universe, in looking at all of the three scientific theories, see, what happens in the Western world is that they, they like to chop things up. They don't like to, that's why you have a math department, a science department, and among the math departments, you have those that are into calculus, those that are into geometry, trigonometry, and science. You've got the biologists, the botanists. But when we get into our lesson plans, you're going to see that you can't separate them. You can't separate math from science. You can't separate, I mean, they have something now for reading in the content area. Reading in the content area is nothing but holistic learning. But see, they changed the name of it so that you can think that uh, they created it. And in thinking that they created it, you will respect them more. Not realizing that the Africans had this story down thousands of years ago. And not only did they have the story in place, but it worked for them to the point where they could create a society that was basically, for the most part, free of warfare. Somebody didn't give up some of these things. Somebody came in after. Uh huh, okay, okay, I got you. If somebody came in, does that mean that they don't have a lesson plan? Focus. Focus. Spatial. It gives you the ability to, to space. You see, these are things that we assume that children know. And this is what I meant when I said that there will be things that I go back, and it's not that I am talking down to you. It's that I want you to see on the level that a child is thinking and learning. This would be a great task for a student. To be able to look for the outer ring and find this one. And what is the first one? Pluto. Pluto. How about the second one? Yep. What's the next one? Does Uranus have another planet that looks like Saturn? Saturn? Jupiter. Jupiter. 
Jupiter. What comes after Jupiter? Mars. After Mars? After uh, Earth? And after Venus? Now let's look at this story and then we're going to take a break. Let's, let's look at this story. And it's going to lead us in, 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 into the next part. Pluto is far away from the planet Nebula. What is basically the temperature on Pluto? Cold. cold very cold. How about Neptune? Cold. Okay. How about Uranus? Saturn? Cold. Jupiter? Cold. Getting warmer, right? How about Mars? How about Mercury? Very, very hot. Uh, How about Venus? <laughs> what does that tell you about Earth? It must be the right one. Right one. <laughs> right one. Right, right balance for life. Right balance for life. As we know it. As we know it. It is like the parent, it is like the parent said to the entire universe or the solar system, you know. We're all going to be giving off different forms of life or different things that we're going to do. But in order to bring our, our universe into perfect balance, it's going to have to be the planet with the perfect mix of different qualities that are exactly like the parent sun. And remember, the parent sun is the balance of perfect opposites. There is something within our atmosphere that puts us the distance that we are from the sun that has allowed life to flourish on this planet as we know it. But I dare say, let us not say that there is no life on other planets. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm saying this because we are too earth-centered and we think that anything that does not look like us is not alive. There are many different forms of life within the universe and only the universe can define it. In Africa, it, they were able to look at Pluto and Uranus and Neptune and Mars as all related to them. And that they were going to keep the cosmos in perfect balance by the way in which they did things on Earth. We are now living in a society that has uh, flipped the whole concept of what the ancients thought of in terms of living in harmony. And because of that, we are out of harmony. Of all of the things that exist in our universe, the only essence out of its orbit is the human being. The seasons come when they're supposed to, and the only reason why the seasons are messing with us now is because we messed with them before. If we hadn't done that, this wouldn't be going on. When you look at what's going on around us, what we're looking at is the human family who was supposed to be the highest form of intelligent life in our solar system going out of whack with itself. And we are really in very serious trouble, and we've got to bring this back around. Now, I would like to end this part of it, and I'd like to ask if there are any questions, any comments, preguntas, comentarios. I have one comment. Yes. When a um, few um, years ago, the Family Life Sex Education Curriculum was, um, well, a while ago, proposed, right? And parents had to sign and all of that. And as you described the concept of reproduction, it, it seems so natural and it seems so non-threatening, you know, um, and, and so that's what I just wanted to make the comment okay. And I'm glad you made the comment because, you know, prior to coming here, you always wonder what you're going, the impact it will have mm -hmm. on the people that you're talking to. For some, this is the first time you've ever heard anything like this before. Mm -hmm. For some of you who have been bombarded with the works of George G.M. James and Jacob Carruthers alone, is very, is very powerful, not talking about what you've been exposed to with John G. Jackson. And I'm always interested in the impact, and what I'm after is the naturalness of how the Africans could put a curriculum together, because this world has made learning too hard, mm -hmm. and very unpleasant. Yeah, it's very unpleasant. Uh, the concept of the war that we play with our children, by teaching them something and then giving them a worksheet. I mean, when we're working this worksheet, all of you are you're not threatened. She's not worried about if you don't get, you know, all four right, that you're going to fail. It's, it's, it's a level of comfort that you're learning. Uh, I'm working with you. This is the worksheet that we work together on. This is what I'm encouraging us to do with our young people. Now, for the sake of Xerox and the other things, I always suggest that you make three copies of worksheets. 
So what I would do at the end of this is I would give you another worksheet. This is what I'm going to do as we go along. And as, a, as I get this situation more tightly uh, in place, you'll get a worksheet to take with you when you go. And you'll get a worksheet the next class. And by the third time, you'll know it. Because the information is going into your control center or your melanin center non-threateningly. This information is good, and it's a natural progression. Mm -hmm. That if you can see this, once you see the visual, then you don't have a problem looking at life and seeing your relationship with the cosmos. Unfortunately, we separate education from nature, and we don't understand that the African brought forth education out of nature. They learned what to teach in math and science through nature. Now what is happening is the exact opposite. They are abusing nature in order to get information. So in one, you have the relationship, if I can get back to the Bible, of Abel. And then you have the other of Cain. And then you have the discussion as to who is more worthy. And the creative force said, but of course Abel is. Because Abel is used what he has around him. He has not created all of these tremendous different contraptions for me. He's not really doing it for me. He's doing it for himself so he can say, look, Lord, what I've done. And Abel was just natural. He just did whatever he had in his hand. And that's what the African did, did what was natural. No heavy mathematics, so that children are actually afraid of it, or science, where, where they can't see themselves in it. Yes, Mrs. I think one of the things that's striking to me is, is particularly the story about creation, because you know, I teach English and literature and things, and one of the things they want in the curriculum for us to teach is Greek mythology. Uh -huh. And we know that that deals with chaos. Well, they, their story begins with chaos, uh -huh. and how out of chaos there came the heavens, and, but everything is negative and everything is conflicting. There wasn't this unity and there wasn't this respect of the female and the male principle, and there's a lot of killing and maiming and, and lust and things like that that are all in their theories of, of evolution. That's right. And, and that's, what does that come out? What comes out of their, their two opposites coming together? Conflict. Right. The African, with the two opposites coming together, create balance and harmony. Right. The whole perspective, but see, when we get into the, evolu uh, the life history of the European and Asian, you <clears> see why that, that came about. Because there was a certain thought mentality among those who were those Africans who were exposed to very cold climates. And you can imagine what happens to people when you are exposed to cold climates for thousands of years, and that you are not able to do the things in your environment that Africans were able to do in their environment. And when you return back home, which is the prodigal son, when you return back home or the southern cradle, you bring with you that mentality of destruction. And it still exists today. It's, we're experiencing it right now. But that's a lesson for another day. <laughs> Since the last time we've been together, so many things have happened to change the, 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 the future of this world. And I hope that when we're getting into this conflict that you're looking at many things. But because I have a set amount of time, and because, as my sister Diane said, I can't get carried away, <laughs> I'd like to focus and keep us on track because basically I have another 15 minutes to present, but I would like to take a break because we've had a lot of information. I'd like to take a break. Can we come back at about uh, 10 minutes to? Okay, can, uh, then let's come back together about 10 minutes to 5, and then I'll give you a second part of prior to putting everything in order. You see? So there's no negative term like chaos that you have things indiscriminately doing their own thing. From the African perspective, they were well aware of what they were doing, but because of their function, they had to function in what the Western world would look at as chaos, but in actuality, they were getting ready to put things in order. And the Eni is what puts things in order. Now we're talking about the Earth. We've gone through the concept of those four steps. We've got the planets now in a position where there are nine of them, the moons are forming, the asteroids are forming, and we're in balance. And the planets now are the family of nine. The family decides who will bear the fruit. Perfect balance of opposites and complements. Only one child can bear these fruits. Pluto is too much like the father. Remember we said Pluto was too? And what was the, uh, the, the penetrating star? Cold. Pluto was too much like the father. Neptune, Uranus also. And Mercury and Venus were too much like the mother. And the mother was hot and 
Okay. Earth had perfect harmony. It balanced and was put in balance like his, her parents. Earth would give birth through carbon to the human, who for the entire universe would fathom the secrets of all time and elevate the universe to a higher level. But while to us it has taken billions of years, to the creator God it has been but a twinkling of an eye. The Enid. In the Enid, in the Memphite theology, you have in the book of knowing the evolution of Ra, the essence, Neber Cher, records the following story of creation and the birth of the gods or essences of order and arrangement. I'm including these words because that's what you're going to come upon in your reading. When you see the word God, I use the word essence or nature. I am he, she. I changed he, she. It was presented as he because you know who you know who presented this, right? Okay. I am he, she, who evolved him herself. I added the herself. They had himself. Under the form of the God or essence, Kephra. What in that first sentence have I told you about the theosophy of the ancient Africans? I am he, she. I. What is I? God. One. God. One God. In the words of the ancient Africans, they admitted to but one God. This whole concept of many is totally out of place in the African world. But for us to disrespect our faith systems, they have made it seem as if the African faith system is polytheistic or many godded. And it's not. One, from the very beginning they're telling you, I am he, she, who evolved him, herself, under the form of the God or essence Kepra. I. Again, they say, I, the evolver of the evolutions and developments, which came forth from my mouth. Remember the concept of word and things coming out of mouth and naming things is very important to give each thing its name. And when we go back to the Bible, what do we see happening? Each was given a name. Comes directly out of the African mindset. I, the evolver of evolutions and developments which came forth from my mouth, no heaven existed and no terrestrial animals or reptiles had come into being. I formed them out of the inert mass of watery matter. This is a story of the Africans telling how the earth was formed. We're going to get into the scientific perspective of how the earth was formed, and I want you to compare the two, understanding that the African came thousands of years before the European. Please understand that the Western world was still thinking that the Earth was flat and that the Earth was the center of the universe when the Africans for thousands of years had already fathomed who the sun was and what the sun was to the family on Earth. Okay. Uh, so in it coming out of watery matter, what is it saying? It's returning back to the concept of... Say it. Nun. Nun. Out of watery mass. Matter, uh, watery matter. I found no place whereon to stand. I was alone. And the gods or essences, Shu, which is air, and Tefnut, which is water or moisture, had not gone from me. There existed none other who worked with me. Immediately, what is this saying? No one else around. I, I, the main God, the only God. Uh, there existed none other who worked with me. I laid, I, laid the foundation of all things by will, and all things evolved themselves therefrom. I united myself to my shadow. What is a shadow? Yes, but what is it when you it's think about it? Image, right? it's, an image. it's an image that is projected by what? Sun. Sun. Light. Light. Okay? Okay, so now, you have a dark representation of the human who comes... In the dark, because of the essence, like at nighttime, in the essence of a dark, when you walk underneath a light, your shadow is projected. If the light is behind you, it's projected in front of you. If the light is in front of you, it's projected behind you. But what is the shadow? The shadow is your representation when the light shines. Or it is your complement. You know that song, Me and My Shadow? You know that song where they always have black folk chasing after the European as the shadow? The shadow, the concept of the shadow, is yourself through the light. 
Okay, so you have darkness and light balancing itself. And what did we say was the creation of the universe? Was the balancing of the opposites or the complements? So this essence united himself, herself, to his, her shadow, and set forth Shu and Tefnut out of myself. Thus from being one God, they even say it, thus from being one God. So I'm saying this and I'm emphasizing because I don't want you to get caught up with Akhenaten who in the 18th dynasty talks about monotheism. Because you're waiting until thousands of years after there was already a concept of one God. So we don't have to wait to get to Akhenaten to deal with monotheism when we can deal with it from thousands of years prior to Akhenaten's existence. Okay. Uh, I united myself to my shadow and set forth Shu, which is air, and Tefnut out of myself. Thus from being one God, I became three. What is three? The Trinity. Have we heard the Trinity before? Okay. And Shu and, Tuf, uh, Shu and Tefnut gave birth to Nut, which is the sky, and Geb, which is the earth. And Nut gave birth to Osiris, or Usir, Aset, uh, Setesh, Nebetet, and Heru. Now we're going to get into them next week. Because each, you see, each week is getting closer and closer to where we're going. Next week we deal with the human family. Usir, Aset, Setesh, Nebetet, and Heru represent the human family being born within the world. But there's something that's happening here, and this is another thing that we have to understand about the Enid. And that is the Enid is talking about the development of life on earth. So what they're saying is this. First, you have the one God, that is the creator and sustainer, that comes in the form of Kephra. Now, Kephra is a dung beetle. It's represented as a dung beetle, and we have to know what a dung beetle is. And remember when we talked about Impu, or Anubis, and the, the relationship that that animal, the dog, had being a discriminator, they also looked at Kephra and came to realize that this dung beetle along happy in the Nile, would lay its eggs and put it in dung. And it would roll this egg and roll it while the eggs were actually maturing. And finally, these baby dung beetles, thousands in numbers, would come forth in happy. So when the Africans looked at this wonderful phenomenon among the dung beetle, they looked at the evolution and the life history of the world and saw that also, just like a round figure, that there was a ball being rolled, and out of the ball rolling constantly, life came forth from this ball. So they equated Kephra with Atum. So Kephra, in essence, also has the, has the uh, background of Atum, or also has the creator potential of Atum. Now, where that causes confusion sometimes is that many times, People say, well, how can two things have the same background or characteristics? And that's because the Africans were able to look at the world holistically. See, here we can't. Remember, this world looks at everything in departments. If you're this, you can't be that. But let's look at an actor. Let's look at an actor who one day plays a role. And this, on this particular day, he's a doctor. His next role is, let's say, he's a musician. Has the role that the actor played changed? Yeah. So he must then look forward and be a different person, but in essence, it's the same, right? Mm -hmm. Natures are the same way. Natures are like the actors, not the parts that they play. Mm -hmm. Natures can change, but it's the situation that change more than it is the nature. So you can have Kephra representing life on earth, and you can have Atum also representing life on earth. They are both the same role, but they're just two different characters who are impacted by a different situation. Is, is that understood? Because if you can understand that, that's very important. Because you're going to see a tomb represented five ways. There are five ways that you can look at a tomb. You can look at a tomb as a primal serpent who delineates the boundaries of the earth and the uh, sky. You can see the... Um, uh, Atum as a, 
primeval sun or energy that rests on Ptah, like in that diagram we had. A tomb is also a phoenix bird, which when uh, is crushed to dust can rise again. It's the uh, Kepra dung beetle, it's the sun Ra, and it can also be Aten, that Akhenaten put together. So Atum can represent many things, and the Netras represent many things also. And I just want you to see that and to know that they're multi-referential is what I'm trying to get at. They refer to many things. Yes, my sister. But they are, in essence, one. Absolutely. They all are one. They all come underneath the Godhead that has not been explained. And the only time you come upon it is when you deal with Amun. And the reason why Amun is looked at as the overall Godhead, Amun-Ra, is because it's hidden. And everything that is of sacred nature is really hidden. And the only way that you can get to the sacred, which is hidden, is by going through what is revealed, or who is Amun's uh, uh, complement? Amunet. So you can get to the hidden only through the revealed. Did, did I answer your question? Okay. Mm. Okay. So the Eni has different characters. And it's important that when we're looking at this, that we're able to put it together. Can I, may I ask you, can you pass this out a little bit? And this will save me some time. What I want you to do is to look at this story that I'm going to hand out. From this point, you have Kepra Atum giving birth to Shu and Tefna. Air, moisture. Okay? You then Shu and Tefna give birth to Nut, Sky, and Geb, Earth. Geb is male. Nut is female. Mm -hmm. Can you take the staples out of it? And the sky gave birth to life. So that's why it's a female, because the female gives birth. The same way that Nut would swallow the sun at night and bring it forward during the day or give it birth to it in the morning. And that was Nut. And when you look at Nut, you see a woman who's extended with her arms forward and leaning over, and she swallows the sun in one side, and she gives birth to it in the morning on the, on the other side. And that represented the 12 hours of the night. And the one thing that we're going to go through constantly is, I'm going to ask you, don't take a story and lock it in as the only story. The one thing that you're going to find in the African world is that there are many different stories. And if you were in a classroom in ancient Africa, and they asked you what you were looking at, and you gave a story, they say, well, that sounds pretty good, if it made sense. Someone else would tell a story, it didn't sound anything like yours, they say, well, that sounds pretty good. The African never believed in opinion being the type of thing where, if I show you this, that's all you can see. If you showed someone an owl, that which, which is a metanatural symbol, and they said, what does that look like to you? It represented the letter M. If, if they said to you, what does that look like to you? They could tell you a lot of things about that owl. And if you went to someone else, they'd tell you a lot of things. African people would never tell you that you're wrong. They would just say, well, that's an interesting theory. In this world, it doesn't exist. It's true, false, true, false. If I can't touch it, it doesn't exist. If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. To the African... Hey, that sounds pretty good to me. Let me see if I can put this... This is what got us in trouble, by the way, because Christianity sounded good to us also. That's what got us in trouble, because Christianity came from us anyway. So when we heard it, we said, well, this is nothing but... You know, we had a brother named Azana talking about that in Ethiopia thousands of years before you guys came. So there's no problem with it. But what they didn't understand was that the manifestations of that faith system was going to be devastating for the African people. Did I answer your question, by the way? Uh, okay. Nut and Geb, what happens is this, is that Shu and Tefna, air and moisture, give birth. So what they're really saying in the real world is that air or oxygen and moisture, hydrogen, give birth to life. Gives birth to sky. 
and to earth. Nut and Geb are in a lover's embrace. In other words, the sky and the earth, scientifically speaking, were locked together. And what happened was is that Shu came between them and separated them, which means that air came and separated the sky from the earth. Doesn't that make sense to you? It's a nice story. It's a, it's a planetary science story that makes sense from a mythological perspective. As long as you can keep your grasp on what's real and what's not real, the story makes perfect sense to you and you can understand and fathom the mysteries of the world around you. But once you start believing these stories literally, then we start getting in trouble. Dr. Clark said, people don't know the difference between myth and reality. If you look at the reality of it, you can see. So Shu or air comes and separates Nut and Geb, which is what happened here. Air is between us, the oxygen, and the, the air that we breathe, separated these two essences, and upon that found that Geb was pregnant. Now, wait a minute, are you saying a male was pregnant? No, they're saying the earth was pregnant. Not saying a male was pregnant, they're saying that the earth was pregnant with life. Because in being in an embrace, there were certain molecules in Nut that nourished the earth while they were together. And that it was the sky, or the atmospheric elements of the sky, embracing the earth, that created the beginnings of what would develop into life as time went on. So Nut and Geb, were, uh, Geb was impregnated, and they gave birth to... Now, why did they give birth? Because Nut gave birth to the sun, and the sun gave birth to the earth. See? I'll say it again. Geb is the earth. Nut is the sky, which swallows the sun every evening, and gives birth to it in the morning. But is, it is the element of the sun and the energy of the sun that actually is impregnating the earth. You see that the virus is very easy to understand. Yeah, okay. Right. And, see, and also in the reading, it'll be easy to understand. And as you see this over and over again, and the next time we meet, I'll be here at 2.30. So we'll be able to talk more about certain things so that, you know, it'll be clearer to you. But this is all science. This is modern day science. The Africans had this in theory thousands of years before the Western world took it over. And everything that they came upon just recently are things that have been embedded in the, in the Memphite theology or the Shabaka stone for thousands of years. Newton gave give birth to Usir, Aset, Setesh. Nebetet and Heru. Usir is the father, or the representing positive, positive characteristics, the positive human being, all those things in a human being that are positive. Aset is his wife and sister. Now, when people look at that and say his sister, but they don't understand the family of, of humans, that each and every one of us my wife is my sister. Prior to our being married, I said, how you doing, my sister? You see, in the sense of being sister and brother, there was, but see, among the European world, the first word come out is incest. <laughs> the first thing that you're going to get a sense of is that how can, and even children, well, Mr. Coleman, how could a, a brother and sister get married and have children? You, you can't do that. Because in their mindset from the European or the Western world, brothers and sisters don't get married, but in reality, in Africa, we are all our brothers and sisters. And if we marry one another, while we are, in a sense, not blood brother and sister, we are still brothers and sisters. Because prior to getting married, brothers call their date sister, or sisters call her hey brother. So this is the concept of the relationship, but not the blood relationship. Aset represents determination. And we can get into all of these aspects as we go along. Uh, Setesh is the lower passions, or the negative aspects of the human being that which overrides the good. Nebetet is really a complement of Aset, is a female or another female within the story of human life on earth. And then Heru is the son of Usir and Aset, or the righteous inheritor of the earth. So out of this, it, this is the Enid. This is the Enid, all the essences of order and arrangement.
I'm sorry? E-N-N-E-A-D. It's not an African word. Okay, I would like you to do, I would like you to do your worksheet number three on your own uh, sometime this week. It should be very straightforward. This next one I would like to do with you. And because of time, I, uh, if, if, if you would please, my sister. Uh, and in the interest of time, I would just like to go through the worksheet number three with you. Can you repeat that again? Say, what, what, what would you like? Between the compliments or the opposites in ancient times, prior to humans, was the battle between land and water. There were some times when the land would be dominant. There were other times when the sea would be dominant. And what they began to talk about was the emergence of a, of a land. And this is what occurred in the Enid when they're talking about the science of the development of land. Remember, you have this. And this is where I say pata, nun pata natum can also be applied to here. What you have happening in, on the earth is that the planet is in a certain situation. And remember, all of the continents are connected. This is prior to the continental divide that took place approximately 10 million years ago. What you have is a war that's going on. And I'm going to draw that war over here. Sometimes the land was underneath. Sometimes the land would rise up out of the the land would rise up out of the water. This is science. What began to happen was that the continent, the continents, as they were connected, let's say that these are all the continents that are connected on the earth, when they were all connected. In the very middle of this whole piece of land, you have what? The African continent. If you look at the center of any map, Africa will always be in the middle. Africa is in the direct middle of all of the continents. The middle of cuts across Africa. The equator, equatorial belt cuts right across and it intersects the Great Lakes region. What you have happening is that the land is rising and falling. And what was in the center that came up the most, that came first up out of the water, was in fact this continent of Africa, and in the center of this was, in fact, a Great Lakes region. What does this, if I could turn this around this way and have you look at it cross, uh, cross cut, what would the symbolism be of land rising up out of water? Oh, yeah. You see, looking at it cross cut. If you came down and looked at all of the planets, I mean all of the continents, with it rising and falling constantly, and then finally the land wins and it comes up, what you have in place is, number one, in the middle, you have Africa. Whereas maybe the other continents are still submerged underneath, and then finally they all rise up out of the water. You have this story of Nun Patana Tum that the Africans spoke about. And this is what scientists say happened. And this is what Africans said happened thousands of years ago. So the whole concept of the life history of the earth was put in place in the Memphite theology. And it came under the Enid, or the concept of all of these things coming into place prior to the human being. But you have air and moisture giving birth to sky and earth, separating the sky and earth, and what you have is the land coming up out of the water. I've taken a spiritual story and a scientific story and brought them together. What the Western world has not done is added the spiritual side or the mythological side of it that shows how this could possibly happen scientifically. Now, Let's talk about some things to bring us up into our next lesson plan, because that's also important. After the earth had come up into, come up out of the land, uh, out of the water, you then have the development or the movement of atum, or creative utterance and mind, coming into play. You now have the naming of the different things that are happening on earth, but the naming is not like naming it. Naming it is actually looking at it happening and recording that this has actually happened. 
Do I need to say that again? Because I want you to understand it's not a matter of naming things. It's a matter of recording that these things have actually taken place and this is actually happening. And what began to happen is that you have four ages. This is earth history now. We've gone from planetary history or planetary science to earth history. You have four ages and you have 16 periods. In the first period or the first age prior to 550 million years ago, 550 million years ago, you had what was known as the Precambrian Age. The Precambrian Age was a time when animal life had not yet reached the level of the insect or the fish. You don't have to write this down. This will be in your text for next week. If you would like to write it down, we can. The second age, between 550 million years ago and 200 million years ago, you have what is called the Paleozoic Age, P-A-L-E-O-Z-O-I-C, Paleozoic Age, which is also known as the Age of the Fishes. During the Paleozoic Age, you have six periods. You have the Cambrian period, the Ordovician period, and for those of you who might be into geology, please know I may be mispronouncing these words. But this basically, correct me if you know the proper pronunciation. Uh, yes, number one is Cambrian period. The second one is Ordovician, O-R-D-O-V-I-C-I-A-N. The third period is Silurian, S-I-L-U-R-I-A-N. The fourth period is Devonian, D E V. O-N-I-A-N, Devonian. The fifth one is Carboniferous, C-A-R-B-O-N-I-F-E-R-O-U-S. And the sixth and final one was the Permian Age. Now, what, what do I want you to know? I want you to know that there was a Precambrian Age. I want you to know that the years approximately was 550 million years. Don't get caught up in dates. Get caught up in the chronology. The dates are going to change. When our children get a hold of this information and they begin to do the research and they become to, they get more advanced ways of knowing and dating that, that surpass what, what, uh, what carbon-14 can do or the potassium-argon series can do. When they start really being able to date, these dates will change. I assure you they'll change. But right now it's good to have a date in the sense of chronology of it. I want you to know that the Paleozoic Age was the age of the fishes. I want you to know that it existed after the Precambrian, and it was approximately five, between 550 to 200 million years ago. But the important thing that I want you to know is that it lasted or was approximately 350 million years. Now, that's a long time. That's what I want you to know, that it took a long time. The Precambrian Age was what? Precambrian period was the first one of the Paleozoic Age. Okay. I have purposely not put dates on them. You can get dates if you go to your encyclopedias. You can get dates if you go to different books. But I choose not to because I don't want to cloud you with information that I don't think is important. What I think is important in terms of a date is that it was approximately 550 million years ago, lasting approximately to 200 million years ago. The, the, the third age. The third age was known as the Mesozoic Age. The Mesozoic Age lasted, M-E-S-O-Z-O-I-C, lasted from 200 million years, approximately 200 million years ago, to 75 million years ago. That's a long time. That's a long time. When you think of how long a human being has been in existence, I mean, we are but a, a we're, we're, we're not even a twinkling in the eye. And it's important that, that we see the totality of our existence. You see, we think that everything existed now that we're here. But we don't know that civilizations have lived and died in Africa and have lasted thousands of years and that no trace can be made of them because no one has an interest in them. Now we're getting an interest in them. And when we go back, you know, people are talking about 4,000 years about ancient Kemet. When you get into the real history of Kemet, you're going to go back tens of thousands of years, 40, 50, 60,000 of years. This is all done by people of, of Western mentality. When we get back and get into the real research of our own culture and history, these dates are going to be so different from what we get together that uh, it's good to know the chronology of them. 
In the Mesozoic age, it was also known as the age of the reptiles. Geologically, it was known as the Middle Ages. In the Mesozoic age, the first period was known as the Triassic, T-R-I-A-S-S-I-C. The second was Jurassic, J-U-R-A-S-S-I-C. And the final was Cretaceous, C-R-E-T-A-C-E-O-U-S, Cretaceous. The final age, and that's the age that we are still in, was known as the Cenozoic Age, C-E-N-O-Z-O-I-C. This was the age of the mammals, and that existed approximately 75 million years ago to the present. The first period of the Cenozoic Age was the Paleocene. Paleocene, P-A-L-E-O-C-E-N-C-E, -E -E, Paleocene. I think I added a C at the end that doesn't belong there. But I'll, I'll know once I get to my notes. But it's basically Paleocene. The second is the Eocene. E-O-C-E-N-E. There's something I want you to know about the Eocene period, and that is when the, I'm sorry, oh, okay. when the modern insectivores began to come into play. The insectivores are the beginnings of mammalian life. Insectivores, not insects. Don't compare insects and insectivores. They are a particular type of human phenomenon or, or, or life phenomenon that began to evolve itself, him, herself, during the Eocene period. The third period is the Oligocene, Oligocene, O-L-I-G-O-C-E-N-E, -E. Oligocene. The fourth and very important period of the Cenozoic Age is the Miocene. And it's the Miocene where it is believed that life history began for the human being. Please know that which has been created can have a life history or can evolve. <coughs> Following the Miocene, which was also very important, is the Pliocene, P-L-I-O-C-E-N-E, -E, Pliocene. The sixth period was the Pleistocene, P-L-E-I-S-T-O-C-E-N-E, -E, Pleistocene. And then the final one, which we are still living in, is the Holocene, H-O-L-O-C-E-N-E, -E, Holocene. Uh, that equals four ages and 16 periods. The in the last one, it has seven periods. The third one has three. The first one has six. There are four ages. I want you to know, I want you to know the ages. It's the age of the fish. The Mesozoic is the age of the reptiles. The Cenozoic is the age of the mammals. world is in that square right now. There is nothing that exists anywhere in our universe that's not in this square right now. And if you can get to this, you can fathom everything. And this is the last uh, worksheet about, about our universe is on this right here. And what it is, first of all, what we have to know is this, that within the world, there are four different 
types of molecules or atoms? There is nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. Now, what's interesting to know is that nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, you can't take any more than four of these atoms. Like, for instance, you can take two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, and you have water. You can take three parts hydrogen and have... I'm sorry? Is that hydrogen peroxide? Oh, that's not hydrogen peroxide. What is that? Hydrogen peroxide is... Okay, H3. Well, let's just say this. Let's scratch that out. Che chemically speaking, I know this is water, and I know this is hydrogen peroxide. Okay, that I know for sure. Let's talk about something. Let's talk about, you can take any, no more than three or four of these to mix them together, and you'll get something that is material, or maybe even air, or, but it's something tangible or breathable. When you introduce carbon, you can take these and link up thousands of different atoms. Carbon is the organizer of our universe, and in particular, our world. When carbon was introduced, when any of the other atoms could be assimilated by carbon, carbon put everything in order. What color is carbon? Okay. Remember that when we talk about melanin. Remember the part that carbon plays in the world when we get to melanin. It's very important. But for now, realize that carbon is known by Dr. Marcella Stewart, who is a melanin expert, as the mothership. It organizes and, in fact, preceded DNA. And, in fact, she believes that it organized DNA. It is the organizer of our universe, carbon. That black atom organizes everything, brings everything into, into fruition. Hydrogen can't do it, oxygen can't do it, and nitrogen can't do it. They, you can't get more than three or four atoms. Once you introduce carbon, you can take thousands of these things, and you can build all sorts of different types of chemicals and life systems from carbon. Okay, with that in mind, there are four elements. Shu, Tefnut, Nut, and Ge. Look at the elements. What elements do we have? Air, water, earth, uh, well, water, water is moisture. Fire. Let's put fire here. And by the way, what was fire's name? Ra. Let's put air over here. How many of you didn't understand that diagram? You know, the one with the... You didn't? Wonderful. Because my test is going to be to make sure that you understand it. This one? Here you have water. The, the one with the squares. Page 80. You know, you know it must be difficult when I know the page number. Water. And what would come here? Earth. What's the opposite of fire? What's the opposite of air? So right here, we've already set up the complements and the opposites so far. Okay, let me ask you this. In terms of the characteristics or the properties of these different elements, what can both fire and air be at the same time? Hot. Hot. Now, if you know that, what do you know about what's here? Oh. What can both air and water be? Moist. Wet. And if you know this, what can both fire and earth be? Dry. But that's not good enough. Ancients took it a step further. They said, well, if you could do, if you could do all this, 
then you can also do colors. And how many of us try to teach our children colors? About the blending and about what will neutralize and all that? What color you think fire would be? Red. Of course. What color would air be? Fire. Yes, but what color? Blue. Yellow. Uh, because of... of um, there's something that someone once told me about uh, that, that air that would make that yellow. There's a word that they use. I, I forgot the word, but, I, but I'll check on it. And that's why they would use yellow. Uh, besides, when you get through all of the other colors, it'll make sense to you. Because this is like a mathematical theorem. If you can fill out one, you can fill them all. And it works out like a mathematical theorem. So even if I left yellow out and didn't know it, when we finished everything else, it would automatically, by, by trial and error, what would water be? Now, yes, water can be green, and you're, and you're going to see something about that color green and its relationship to this uh, square. Earth, what color would earth be? Brown. What's a, okay, uh, indigo, indigo, it's, it's indigo. What have we just done here? Not only opposites, but what else have we done? What is the rainbow? What happens if you were to blend red and yellow? What color would you get? Orange. How about yellow and blue? Green. The principle of moisture returns back to green like my sister was talking about. What happens if you mix blue with indigo? What do you get? Which tell, Indigo is a dark blue. It's, it's a blue-black. That's how Indians got their name. You ever heard of Indian black? That's indigo. That's how they got their name. If you mix indigo and blue, and this is interesting about the African diaspora and the color of indigo, which is blue-black. You get indigo. This is such a dark color. Anything you mix with it, think about us now as a people. Anything you mix with it becomes it. Isn't that true about us? If you mix indigo and red, what do you get? No. no. Brown. Somebody said it. Purple. Yes, I know, but I, I, I really said that more in the sense of the color blue and indigo, a dark color. When you mix a dark color with another dark color, it becomes that dark color. Like if you mix a very dark complexion person with a very light complexion person, Sometimes they come, they always come dark, but chances are they come closer to the darker member than they do the lighter member. That's really what I meant. I didn't complete the statement that I made. Indigo and red becomes purple. But now if you were to assign one of these to the uh, diagram we have here, which one would fire be? It's the organizer, the collector, the creator. Carbon. How about air? Oxygen. How about water? How about earth? This diagram was created thousands of years ago by ancient Africans. And in all Greek and Roman um, uh, work, they take from this. Aristotle did, uh, uh, Socrates did, Plato did, the humors, all of it is taken directly out of the African diaspora, yet no one gives credit to the Africans for having created it. I'm sorry, same thing with the Zodiac. I'm gonna offer a lesson plan in agriculture and we're really gonna get into uh, African astrology so that we can see where astrology comes from. So when this room about the earth being indigo as opposed to being thinking of it as brown or green? Because it, sand wasn't really looked at or the dirt wasn't really looked at as the primary source of what made the land. What was looked at as made the land was carbon. Remember the word Kemet meant black land and it, it also represented the black neighborhood or the black person. They did not look at brown as being the color that actually made land what it was. They looked upon the darkness or the indigo or the black uh, that actually created the land. So what we can see also 
though, is the Orishas, you know, your Orishas, and you have various colors. That's right. That, that, the colors of the element. That's right. They all That's exactly right. And when you look at this overall diagram, color-wise, you're looking at the rainbow. Right, absolutely. Very natural phenomenon. My brothers and sisters, are there questions? Comments? Yeah, I have something that I'm a little confused. It was the Western world or the foreigners coming into Africa and changing their mindset that destabilized the African continent. So when we go in there and we look at the Christianity of today in Africa, what we're really looking at is the job that was done on African people who welcomed these people onto their land because they were preaching the same doctrine that they already believed in. And, but what happened was as time went on, what these powers said was that, you remember your God that you worship? That's no longer the God to worship. This God now is the God to worship. And so it destabilized the African continent by offering a spirituality that they had had for thousands of years and, and, and in fact had created. Because as time goes on, we're going to talk more about spirituality, but I'd like to be very gentle because I do understand that there are people who are very deeply steeped in the Christian faith system. And I assure you that whatever I'm saying, I was born and raised Christian. I consider myself still to be a Christian because I understand the African roots of my Christianity. Whether or not I choose to accept the Christianity of an oppressor is another story. Whether or not I choose to embrace the African concept of my Christianity, understanding that through the African diaspora, it has all, always been prophesied that Christianity would be an earth faith system. I'll stop there. I was about to say something. Shemem Hotep Amunasar. And that's what's important to know when we get into the other lesson plans, like melanin. Yeah, when that you look at the yeah. and then like you look at folk of dark complexion and see what they're able to achieve. You can go back and look at the carbon atom and understand that that's the organizing atom that puts everything in its place. And this is the science of it. That when we're confronting people, we talk to them on a scientific level and they can't argue with us. If we get emotional, then you lose it. Now, you said something about the upside down. No, sideways. What I wanted us to do was to look at the world from this perspective so that we can see the actual landmass of Africa rising up out of the water. And then from that, which becomes this, and then on the land there comes life, there comes civilization, there comes a lot of things, which is our tomb. What? You see, Atum represents creative This is Nun. Where, where this is, Nun. This is Pata. Pata. And then Atum. Atum. So here you have coming up out of the out of water, land, and on top of the land, up out of the water, on the land comes light. A wonderful, you know, bringing yeah, things together. Yeah. Because I tell you, when I first I started out with a Kemet warrior, I know. What he was talking about. <laughs> what in novels was I mean, I was like. When I got to George Jones, I understood. You know, I really got me to do my